Hey, it's Mikey. I'm the guy that just got my personal training certificate from a six hour online course and I'm going to give you some really generic ways to burn fat and lose weight by reducing calorie intake. Mikey, I'm sure you're a nice guy, but let's get a little bit more granular than that. Reducing calories is not the only way that we get in good shape. However, it is still a law of thermodynamics that we still want to pay attention to. So what I have for you today is seven ways to decrease your calorie intake without really realizing it. Okay. Personally, when I went through my 100 pound transformation, I was not a fan of restricting caloric intake. I did, but it was not what I was leaning towards. That's why I did much more of a lower carb protocol because I felt like I was able to eat more, even if maybe I wasn't. Anyhow, I digress. Let's jump right into it. First one, it is kind of a Mikey statement. <laughs> Just eat more lean protein. But Mikey might not be able to tell you that lean protein has a very powerful thermic effect. Okay, it's not just the fact that eating more lean protein is going to keep you full. Okay, that's something you'd probably hear on The Biggest Loser and you can get with regular broadcast television. But what they don't tell you is that eating more lean protein ends up taking 20% more calories just to digest. So yes, you end up eating less, but the amount that you do eat ends up incinerating more calories just through the thermic effect of food, which makes up a good percentage of your overall caloric burn throughout the day anyway. Anyhow, let's move on to some more esoteric, interesting stuff. The next one is going to be having a handful of berries one hour before you have any other carbohydrates that might easily be overdone. Now, this isn't just me talking. There's some cool data here. The journal Appetite found that eating a small, like half a handful of berries, about 50 to 65 calories worth of low glycemic berries, like blackberries, strawberries, things like that, just amounting to like seven to nine grams of carbohydrates worth, if you had that one hour before a pasta meal, those subjects ended up consuming about 130 calories less with the pasta than those that didn't have the fruit. We're talking a small amount. Why is this happening? Well, it could have to do with a little bit of the insulin response, but it's probably not because most of those berries are higher fructose and don't have a whole lot of an insulin response to begin with. So maybe there's a hormone signaling pathway we don't know about, but the data is pretty interesting and I've experimented with it myself and I find like I don't go into as much of a food coma because I don't eat as much of a cheat meal if I have a little bit of berries before a cheat meal. So it is an interesting hack to ultimately net out with less amounts of calories being consumed. This next one's kind of fun because it's manipulating how we draw water into the small intestine intestine and things like that. kind of wild and sounds weird. But if you have a little bit of bone broth prior to eating a meal, it can satiate you tremendously. Not to mention there's health effects too in a positive way, but bone broth is what we call a hydrophilic colloid. Okay. When you consume bone broth, the gelatin and the collagen will actually draw some water into the small intestine, into the colon a little bit, and can actually have a restorative effect on your gut, which we've talked about in other videos, but this also upregulates what is called cholecystokinin, okay, CCK, which elevates your overall satiety. So it makes it so you don't feel as hungry. So usually when I say break a fast with bone broth, a lot of times it's because people that are doing intermittent fasting, they have a tendency to want to eat a bunch of food right when they break their fast. Well, if you have a little bit of bone broth before that, it kills that urge a little bit because of the hormonal response, but also physically what it's doing with drawing some water in. So if you want to just eat a little bit less before a meal, sip on four, eight ounces of bone broth. Put a link down below, by the way, for the bone broth I use, which is Kettle and Fire. Highly, highly recommend them. They're kind of the OGs in the bone broth space anyway, but just for the heck of it, there's a special link and a special discount down below. Highly, highly, highly recommend you check them out. Next one is getting tryptophan rich proteins. And this is a little bit of a plot twist because you're probably thinking, all right, I get more tryptophan. I simply eat foods that are higher in tryptophan. Well, no, that's a Mikey statement. A Thomas statement where we're looking at things a little bit more in depth. We want to look at the tryptophan to other, uh, other amino ratio. You see, what happens is tryptophan gets into your brain and it signals, yes, you to be relaxed, you to calm down, fall asleep, but it also signals you to be satiated. That's why after you eat a bunch of turkey, you don't really even want to have the pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving, right? You just don't feel like it. It's because it has that effect. But if you want more tryptophan to actually get absorbed, you look at the ratio of tryptophan to other aminos because tryptophan competes with what are called large neutral amino acids to get into the brain. So if you were to say eat some red meat, 
okay, not that red meat's bad, but red meat is lower levels of tryptophan and higher amounts of large neutral aminos. Well, those large neutral aminos are going to get into the brain and that's going to potentially block the tryptophan from getting into the brain. So you're not getting that calming effect. In the case of turkey, you have high amounts of tryptophan, but still pretty high amounts of other aminos too. So you're actually not getting that much tryptophan in the brain as you would think. But if you have something like fish or shellfish, you have an exponentially better ratio of tryptophan to other large neutral aminos. This means that by eating a little bit of fish with dinner or even with lunch, you're going to satiate yourself significantly more from a neurotransmitter side of things. So that serotonin uptick, that melatonin uptick, that's gonna help you feel calm and help you go to sleep a little bit sooner. Anyway, it's going to make a big difference. That's why if you have a fatty cut of salmon, Come on, be honest, you don't typically feel like eating a whole lot afterwards. It's not just a happens to be, it's kind of a matter of fact. And then when it comes down to some breakfast options. Okay, eggs, absolutely. The American College of Nutrition had published a study that showed that subjects that ate eggs over any other kind of breakfast ended up consuming about 130 less calories with lunch. Why this is, it could be choline and the neurotransmitter effect, it could be the satiation effect of the fats, it could be a lot of different things, but it's pretty wild. But then when they looked at these subjects and they had them do a dietary recall of the rest of the day after eating eggs for breakfast, they said they ended up consuming less throughout the rest of the day, not just the subsequent meal. So what is it about eggs? Why is this happening? Don't really know. Could it be the protein? Could it be the fats? Either way, eat eggs instead of the bagel. Okay, and the next one, in case you want to flip-flop and try something else, cottage cheese yielded similar effects. Now, cottage cheese, we could probably argue, is the casein proteins that are getting broken down a little bit slower. Cottage cheese tends to have a gelatinous-like effect within the gut that probably just keeps you satiated and elevates, again, that cholecystokinin that we talked about a little bit earlier with bone broth. Another fun one that you can do that's a little bit of a hack and something that I've messed around with myself is taking Greek yogurt that's unsweetened, which already has a very satiating effect, not just because of the protein, but mainly because of the probiotic content, and then adding about a tablespoon of chia seeds to it. So chia seeds are also going to draw water into the small intestine. So yes, you have a fiber, you have an omega-3, that's all fine and dandy. But if we look at the mechanical effect of what's happening and the distorted hormone signaling that comes as a result, that's where we get the benefit. So we get the protein from the Greek yogurt, which satiates us in a traditional protein way. We get the probiotics from the yogurt, which signal that gut-brain access through the vagus nerve to help our brain ultimately have a signal that everything is healthy and we don't need to be having these crazy cravings. And then you have sort of the mechanical change that occurs by adding the chia seeds in there, drawing water in, therefore distorting the signal. I say distort, but basically it's tricking your body into saying, oh, there's food in the small intestine. Elevate the signaling to the brain that says we don't really need to eat as much anymore. So Mikey, I love you, man. You're doing a great job and your generic caloric restriction advice is saving probably eight to 12 people. It's great. I just want people to know that there's different ways to get a little bit less calories in and different ways to stimulate that overall satiety response. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I promise I'm not a sarcastic jerk. I just like to have fun every now and then. See you tomorrow.